Welcome everyone and thank you for being here. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. And thank you for joining us for our special event. My name is Diana Yalacha and together with my dear friend Amir Husak, I am a programmer of the Bosnian Herzegovinian Film Festival. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Amir Husak and welcome on my behalf as well. Uh, today's panel is an opportunity to discuss diasporic and migrant filmmaking as it relates to Bosnian cinema in a broad sense. Uh, we believe also this is the first time these filmmakers are brought uh, into a joint conversation and in some cases this was their first opportunity to see each other's work. Diasporic filmmaking, which is sometimes also called exilic or accented cinema, has become increasingly prominent and is a frequent topic of study for film scholars. All these, of course, are very broad terms that can be defined in many different ways, including films made by filmmakers who originally come from one country or region, then migrate and make films elsewhere, or films on the themes of diasporic, immigrant, exilic, and displaced experiences. Often these definitions overlap as many immigrant filmmakers make films about diasporic experiences, as is the case with several of our panelists today. The reason such cinema is of great interest for many contemporary film scholars is that these films reflect the experiences of an ever increasing number of people around the globe where national identity and belonging are not a singular nor one dimensional thing, but rather multifaceted, multiplied, even fractured altogether. And since when it comes to Bosnia and former Yugoslavia, the question of national identity is already fraught to begin with. And since we ourselves are a diasporic film festival, we thought it would be fitting to have a panel like this. Uh, in programming our festival over the last few years, uh, Diana and I uh, both have noticed that a great number of submissions we, re we receive each year belong precisely to this category of diasporic or exilic cinema, whether it be filmmakers hailing from Bosnia and now living and making films somewhere else, or films that feature the themes of diasporic immigrant experiences, including the search, as well as a return either to a real or imagined home or homeland, especially if that home and homeland no longer exists. Uh, these films tackle the questions of multiple identities within a single person, uh, a sense of in-betweenness and belonging or lack thereof. Uh, because we are a small festival with limited uh, time slots, film slots, we were not able to program uh, in our official selection all such films that came our way but many of them we did, including Enes and Diadovic's Take Me Somewhere Nice, Timur Makarovic's Nothing But The Wind, Aida Begic's Never Leave Me, Amir Karagic's Stalemate, and we should also mention Igor Vilic's The Waiting Room and Krivina, to name just a few important works, aside from those that are already in the program, in the special program this year, and whose directors are today with us. And speaking of the films who, uh, which are currently featured in our retrospective, the term diasporic cinema can be applied to all of them and to the work of our guests today. Films that we feature in our showcase, if in, in, in case you haven't checked them out yet, they will be available until May 31st. Um, in the interest of time, and because we have uh, quite a few participants, we uh, won't do the longer introductions. Our guests' longer biographies are uh, on the festival website, so you can find them there. I do need to say that unfortunately, Una Gunyak could not be with us due to unforeseen circumstances, but we still highly, re uh, absolutely recommend you watch her excellent, excellent short film, The Chicken, if you haven't already. Uh, we do, however, have a last minute addition to the panel and more about that in a second. Uh, also, I would like to point out that if time permits, we will uh, be able to take some questions from you, our audience. You can enter your questions in the chat box next to this video stream. And without further ado, so please join us in welcoming, and I will ask the filmmakers just to say hi and tell us where you're joining us from today. Um, Alexandra Odic, the director of Great Wall of China. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me here tonight. I, I'm in Berlin, Germany. 
Thank you, Alexandra. Welcome. Uh, Sabina Vairacha, the Director of Variables. Hi, everyone. I am uh, tuning in from Los Angeles, California. Welcome, Sabina. Uh, Adu Hasanovic, the Director of Nomophobia. Do we have Adu with us still? Uh, yes, hello, hello. Good evening, uh, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, I'm uh, based in Rome. Uh, at the moment, I'm in uh, Zagreb. So, hi, everybody. Hi, Adu, welcome. Hi, Adu and everyone else, and very nicely diasporic and transnational. Um, and Adu, uh, since you're based usually in Italy, I think congratulations are in order with respect to the Eurovision Song Contest. So had to do the uh, shout out. Um, and we also are happy to have with us today Boyan Bodrušić, who is the director of the Museum of Forgotten Triumphs. Hi, Boyan. Hi, um, I'm joining you guys from Vancouver. Here it's, uh, I guess, still kind of morning technically or just past. Uh, so yeah, nice to uh, nice to be here with you all. Good, I, I hope we, we provide for a nice morning for you. We're in many different time zones as you can all tell and, and probably our audiences are as well. We also have with us Goran Kapitanovic who's the director of two films we have in our retrospective, My Aunt in Sarajevo and Refugee 532. Hi, Goran. Hello, hello. Um... In Stockholm, Sweden, it's nine o'clock in the evening and still very bright outside, Scandinavian lights. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this conversation and uh, looking forward to talk with you guys. Thank you, Goran, and great to see you again. Um, as all of you, of course, and in a way, these pandemic circumstances with the uh, virtual gatherings have made it possible to have gatherings that we otherwise wouldn't have had in person or would have been more difficult to pull off in person. I mentioned last minute addition to our panel, but unfortunately he hasn't joined yet. Hopefully he will. Um, if he does, we will announce him. It was, it was Ogi Tomic, a filmmaker and cinematographer based in London, whose film Finding Family is also featured in our uh, current uh, showcase of best of BHFF. So hopefully he will be able to join us. So to start with, um, thank you again and welcome um, uh, to, this, to this panel. Um, and all of you are, as we've just seen in your introductions, are residents and citizens in some cases of, so to say, a new country for decades now, uh, places that you now consider to be your home. But the question of home seems to haunt us in the diaspora in a peculiar way. So many continue, and maybe I'm speaking for myself here, to be present in both places, so to say, always ending up uh, somewhere in between, between languages, geographical locations, different film production, distribution, and film funding networks. And this being in between can be both a blessing and a curse. Can you speak about, uh, and this is a question to, to all of you, can you speak to, about this existing or working from in between? How does it affect you and your work? And maybe we can start with uh, Boyan. Um, sure. So I'm actually very curious about everybody else's answers because I think uh, all of these places where we come from these days are so different. And I think Europe, Europe is quite different from North America and the immigrant experience is probably very different in, in Europe as well. So Vancouver itself, I mean, there's a kind of a history here, obviously of indigenous peoples and everything that kind of before is sort of the uh, other source of settlements here, but the kind of city as it is now is probably about a little more than a hundred years old. Um, it's an immigrant city. Um, so now I almost feel kind of like an old Vancouver and I've been here like 20, 25 years and it's constantly changing. So it's not, there's not a sense of, um, I would say, of kind of homoge homogeneous culture. So everything is always in flux here. And so you're part of that flux. Um, I don't feel like I'm kind of up against any sort of um, entrenched cultural sort of existing things. Oh, I suppose there is a bit of that. So you do feel maybe a little bit on, on the outside of it. So this idea of in between us is kind of uh, there, not just because of where I'm from, where I'm now, but the, the, the place that I'm in itself kind of embodies that thing. So it's kind of a confusing thing. I don't really know. I, I think the, 
where it really play, what it really plays into for me, what I think about a lot is who am I trying to make these films for? Who will understand what I'm trying to do? Um, kind of where do you get your motivation to make the films? Like, how do you, those are the kind of things, I mean, I'm a little bit all over the place right now. Excuse me, I'm kind of like running a little sleep, but I guess that's the kind of stuff that I, that I think about a lot is, is, is why do I want to do what I'm doing and who am I doing it for? And it's never entirely clear to me. I feel like it's an ongoing process. Um, but what I'm really kind of curious about is to hear from, uh, like our panelists here who are working in Europe, where I feel they are kind of working from within societies or cultures that are more homogeneous, more kind of entrenched. So I, I kind of want to pass the baton. <laughs> sure, no problem. Uh, uh, we yeah. can pass the baton to our Europe based. I might have something to add once I hear everybody else, but uh, course, maybe that's something to get us started. To, yeah. We want this to also be a conversation between yeah, yeah, all yeah, yeah. of you, because actually we should point this out to our audiences. Some of you have not been able to encounter each other's films or each other uh, prior to this event. So that's important as well. Alexandra and Goran uh, and then Ajo, do you want to say something about this in-betweenness from the perspective of being based in Europe and your particular context that you are in? Should I start? Yes, please. Hi again. So um, first of all, I'm, we, I am the one of those who are in Europe. So for us, um, if we talk about uh, going to, to Bosnia or former Yugoslavian countries to, to work there, it's not uh, so far away like for you guys in the USA or Canada. This, is, this also, I think, makes a difference. But uh, talking about the own identity and um, feeling like not one unit. Well, this is what what was for me a problem before um, in the first years when when we came to to Germany. Where do I belong? And um, but in the meantime, I live so many years in Germany and uh, in Berlin, which which I like and which I made my home. So uh, it's not um, a problem anymore. I I try to to combine it into one unit, and also it's. Um, it also depends on the project. It's you know what what does the project need? We shoot films where we live, in our new home country, and then we need everything for this specific project, and we 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 dive into that and and we do our research. And I had one film um, that I shot shot. I have one film that I shot in Bosnia so far, fictional film Kineskizid that was shown in your uh, festival, and. Um, here, many things were new for me. It was kind of an experiment for me. If I can find a space for my work in, in my motherland. And also what was very, very interesting to me is how can I work with my mother tongue? Um, how does it affect my work? Does it add something to it and what? Um, because also one thing is writing in your mother tongue um, and go back into this into the language. And another thing is how it's gonna work uh, on set. And it worked very well. I, I liked it. I like it. Um, so, um, and identity. Yeah, maybe, maybe we should um, hear a colleague from another colleague from Europe, what he thinks about it so far from me. Sure, uh, Goran and then Ado. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, I'm. I'm a little bit in different situation now. I've been working with TV series last two, three years now. I'm doing third one now, and if I just what what reason I'm mentioning this because I start with um, um, to doing the I mean uh, my my stories from my mother country, and I made a couple of films when I where I could show that I'm good director that they can um, they can apply for another let's say Swedish or Scandinavian uh, jobs uh, what's the, the the thing what usually happen with you if you're from another country they they give you some uh, they put you in a corner and say you a foreign director from uh, former Yugoslavia or Bosnia, and you will do these kind of movies. And of course, 
I am I was aware about that and I um, tried to do something else and I think I will come back to doing features um, or TV series I uh, in a couple of years uh, I, I make a sto- likely pause right now uh, but I will come with up with some good story what I really want to to make with the big budget or so so far I am in the TV series business right now. So it's my experience, but that's what I mentioned that um, sometimes it's quite complicated that they put you in the corner and say, you will just do this kind of movies. And I don't want to finish like that. So I decided to, to go to the to doing the domestic, I mean, Scandinavian TV series. Absolutely, Goran, you, you bring up a very important point. And, we, and uh, Amir and I were discussing this in our um, planning of the, of the panel. We, we do want to acknowledge that the term diasporic is, is a complicated term and that is not necessarily only positive or negative, but that can actually end up having people be pigeonholed uh, and essentialized about in ways uh, that are problematic. And this doesn't only go for former Yugoslav diaspora, obviously it, it's a much bigger issue, but want to hear thoughts from Ado, uh, on this on this in betweenness, the question of in betweenness. Go ahead. Uh, good evening again. again. Uh, well, what I could say is that, uh, of course, many people uh, calling me and uh, involving me in the projects uh, that are connected with the Balkans or with Bosnia and Herzegovina. So maybe. Uh, if I'm counting my works, maybe 80% of my works actually are uh, connected with Bosnia and Herzegovina. But of course, I have that need to prove for myself that I'm first of all film director, doesn't matter from where I come from. So uh, as well, the I, I'm really glad that you also selected nomophobia that... Uh, uh, that that is a universal story and that uh, is taking place in central of Italy. Of course, I live like more than eight uh, eight years in uh, in Rome, and I'm still searching. I'm still searching which kind of story I could tell about Rome. It's huge. It's uh, um, uh, Rome ate me. So I, I still have to understand which kind of story I could tell about Rome or uh, in general about Italy because uh, from many years you know you have uh, uh, amazing directors film directors uh, history of cinema is uh, of, uh, of Italy is uh, so rich so it's really difficult to understand which kind of story it will be right to tell and so I'm still thinking about it but meanwhile I'm going uh, I'm working still on some projects that are connected, uh, that is uh, that are connecting Italy and Bosnia and Herzegovina. Thank you, Ado. Um, we'll move back to uh, the United States and to Sabina, who is in LA, uh, where, uh, among other things, we will also find Hollywood. Uh, and Hollywood was known to really folding in a lot of uh, diasporic or foreign filmmakers into its kind of a narrative, a narrative fold for or or or, or infrastructure and network of, of productions. Um, um, can you speak uh, about your experiences about this or what this in between might mean for you as, as a filmmaker? Yeah, of course. Um, it's very interesting hearing from people from other parts of the world because in the United States, it's such a huge country. Um, as we all know, and LA has something like 14 million people. And um, there are not many Bosnians in this country comparatively. It's about half a million people, I mean, 500,000 people. Yeah, half a million people. And um, so most of the people I come across, I'm the first Bosnian they've ever met. They don't know what what it is unless they're over the age of 40, they've never heard of it. Um, So big part of my um, experience, both on a personal level, but then definitely in terms of meeting Hollywood executives is to educate everyone first. What happened, where I'm from, what it's about. And um, also, you know, they're always confused when I tell them I'm Muslim because I don't look like what they imagine Muslims look like. Um, And the stories that I tell um, are not something most of them are familiar with. So 
um, my, yes, Hollywood has a tendency to just sort of swallow you up and make you want to tell their stories. And so if you have your own stories that you want to tell, it's a much, much harder path to that. You know, I um, have come across, I wouldn't call it resistance. It's more just ignorance. Like people just don't know. And I'm trying to use the stories that happen to us as sort of uh, more of a universal narrative. So it's like, okay, so this is an intimate story, but if you replace any of these people with anyone you know, it could happen to you as well. Um, and that's very important to me. And I would say that um, as far as my identity, um, I struggled for many years as everybody else has mentioned about who I am and where I belong, um, as well as, you know, I'm, an American filmmaker and I have American stories to tell. And there's also a label of a female filmmaker that I constantly um, am coming up against um, and what that means in Hollywood and what kind of stories women are supposed to tell versus men. Um, and I'm going through a bit of a personal reawakening in that, in that realm. And what I mean by that is after I would say a decade of not wanting to tell Bosnian stories and wanting to really establish myself as a filmmaker, director, first and foremost, I am coming back full circle and really embracing the stories of my past, of our collective past, of Bosnian history. And it's extremely important to me that uh, we make a mark in this country so that we don't get swallowed up so that when people say, oh, you know, that's a French film, they know exactly what it is. And I want people to really know what Bosnia is, who we are, what we represent. And um, a lot of my current projects that I'm trying to get off the ground are, are really around that. And so to answer your question, I think I went from not knowing who I am to being 100% American to now to finding my way back into the Bosnian identity that I was born with. Thank you, Sabina, for your for your thoughts and for everyone uh, to everyone for uh, reflecting on this. And Boyan, I know you said since you went first, you may have feedback depending on what you heard. Did you want to add anything before we? Well, it's it's interesting just listening to everybody. Uh, I guess one one of these things that I've always thought about. I my work so far has been very personal, and even in my mode of production is incredibly personal, very sort of modest. Um, that might change at some point. It might not. I don't know. But I always thought of my just even I'm also very interested in literature and the kind of writers I'm interested in are writers that I these days I think tend to be labeled as auto fiction and and so but because that personal experience involves this uh, let's say kind of fairly layered and complex past and, and and wars and so on that feeds itself into the stories that I've been wanting to tell but I've never wanted to tell stories specifically or necessarily about war, about all this kind of stuff. But what you then run up against is this challenge of, you know, to go, to go back to what Godin said is like, are you going to be suddenly labeled as somebody who's only or expected to make certain kind of films? Uh, because I'm not interested in being some sort of a regional filmmaker or it just, I happen to work from very, very personal place. Um, and, yeah, this film, for those of you who might have seen it as a very personal documentary, but all, all the previous films that I made too have been something on the spectrum of what I would, I guess, they're technically fiction films, but might be termed or might be called, I guess, um, hybrid filmmaking, you know, like where there are elements of what appears to be documentary filmmaking and so on. So for me, that that's a kind of formally very important filmmakers that I really like uh, have kind of worked that way, often, oftentimes working with non-actors. And so because of that way of thinking and working, I have inevitably been drawn into kind of talking about my past, about what happened uh, in Bosnia and former Yugoslavia. But that's always been that challenge. The, the, the thing in the back of my mind is like, because I remember with my first film, doing certain things in that film that I thought were formally interesting, especially at that time, this was, I, I shot it in 2005. And this was just prior to like the whole mumblecore thing in the US and this sort of like minimalist sort of no budget cinema. And, uh, the whole idea of hybrid filmmaking was just slowly emerging. So that I was doing all these things, these things that I wanted to talk about, but, uh, you know, everything, what, what people wanted to know about was like, how real is this? You know, was that real or how real is that? Or how autobiographical is it? Or like, what are you trying to say? It just became so involved with the idea of content. And like, it's almost this sort of um, 
and this kind of curiosity or interest uh, basically about what you're trying to talk about as opposed to other things that I, that I was kind of trying to do. So I'm kind of curious if everybody else has had that experience too, to some degree. Um, I was watching all of your films just in the last couple of days and some of them do seem like, like very personal films as well. Um, but all of them, I guess, inevitably touches on war in some way or another, but I don't think that's all we want to talk about really, right? I mean, I'm kind of curious. Yeah, maybe we can open it up if, if anyone would like to follow up on that with what Brian has proposed. Yeah, that, that's a great uh, question, Brian, and great point. And through reading your biographies and uh, or, uh, reading up on your background, I did notice that most of you, uh, if not all of you, had left Bosnia and the region actually in the midst of the war, right? And and the war was actually the reason for leaving, the, for the exile. Um, and we were actually at this point going to touch on individual films that we feature in our showcase. So uh, as you talk about them, uh, perhaps you can touch on Boyan's question as well, to what extent is that kind of the founding or still the haunting moment um, or continues to be whether it's a moment or a state, um, it is difficult to uh, pinpoint and, and find the right language really for the trauma um, that um, these devastating events have entailed on, on uh, so many people. Um, um, so uh, we were going to start actually in the order in which we introduced you to Alexandra and um, for the audiences who haven't uh, seen the films, ho hopefully this entices you to see them. Alexandra, uh, about your film, um, uh, Great Wall of China, which uh, won uh, the year it was shown at the festival, uh, won uh, Best Short uh, Narrative Film. Um, congratulations again on this. And I think it was recognized on many international film festivals around the world. Uh, it's really a wonderful film. You talked in, in your opening remarks about um, kind of returning uh, to, uh, to your uh, native language, to your mother tongue and, and working and making, creating in your mother tongue. But your film is also in some ways about the departure the departure of a, um, a major character in the film. So tell us about the film and how it came to be, what the experience was going back to um, where you hail from, the part of Bosnia you hail from, which is the area around Derventa, right? So tell us about that. Yes, uh, the small town where I come from is Derventa. And uh, we shot the film um, near Derventa in the villages and, and, and roads uh, close to Derventa. And uh, this was, uh, for me, this was a very, very important and totally new journey. Um, as I said before, um, this was uh, like kind of an experiment, but not, not just an experiment. I wanted to shoot this film, but I didn't know um, what exactly it's going to need. And um, I did the first research uh, to Sarajevo and uh, then it took me quite a long time to figure out how and where um, I shoot and I could uh, shoot this film and many, many people from everywhere in Bosnia helped me. I also did uh, the casting in different uh, cities in Bosnia and also Castor and Anila Gajevic helped me very generously with that. And um, so it uh, took a lot of preparation in order to find the place. And as I said before, this, this uh, space, um, um, yeah, the space that feels kind of right for, for this film and for me. And then um, in the end, uh, we shot it in the in the Edwinta where I come from and uh, this town and people helped me a lot with it. It was the first film shot um, entirely in, in that town. This was very special. I wasn't sure in the beginning if, some, if, if that can work because there is basically no, no film infrastructure. Um, but we set it up all and it was all fine. My crew was, um, um, the, the camera and light crew was from Germany and, and the other um, um, crew members were from Bosnia, Croatia, Serbia. We also had an actress from Poland. So it was very international, very mixed. And I enjoyed that part a lot. And then, um, yeah, also connected to the to the native uh, language. Um, this was um, I I never actually planned to to go to go back to Bosnia to shoot a film. I um, since I studied uh, film in Germany and 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 shot sh my short films in German language, 
and I know this culture here, I would say, um, I live here, but it was kind of, you know, this story was there and I wanted to tell the story and it was like this moment that probably comes uh, to everyone that you really uh, feel you don't even know yet but you feel kind of prepared or you have the need to 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 go back and to work with this part of your life and um, also the the experience of war we that we all have this uh, will always stay with us I think uh, I try to get rid of it um, but it always stays there so I try to work with it but uh, the story is not as you know the story is not about war, I, I don't want to shoot a film about war, who, who wants to do that? But um, it's of course connected, the Bosnian reality uh, nowadays is always somehow still connected to that war. So the story that I wrote was from my childhood, but then uh, during my researches, I um, I put it in, in um, a very present context of as we all know, people are leaving Bosnia, everybody who can go, go. And this is very sad, but this is the reality there and the brain drain uh, that they have there. Um, so I, I connected this to Taurus, it, so it became the film. This was then the, the narrative, of, narrative of the film. And in a way I, I could um, feel uh, both parts, so the child, that stays and loses someone, says goodbye to someone, and also the, the young woman who leaves, because I could understand um, very well uh, the reasons why a person uh, leaves a world that feels too tight, or also, you know, just people want to, to travel the world, and some people cannot. If you have the wrong passport, you just can't. <laughs> um, so those were, yes, that, so far about that film and, and the native uh, language, I, I, as I said before, also, I was, I, I did not read much books in, in my native language. I did not read much in general about what's, what's going on in Bosnia. And uh, that was from that point on where I uh, began my researches for the film and uh, to write the script. The language was the, the first connection for me because it was the, the language, it was, you know, like the, like the very fundamental um, part of a culture. That was something that I took with me. You know, we leave everything. We leave the, we left, we all left the place. But what we all took with us is our mother uh, language, is our native language. And, and I, I just reconnected um, through the language with the culture again. Um, within this film project. Thank you, Alexandra, for your thoughts. And maybe later we, we will connect. Well, Can I ask you some one line about her, her film? Because uh, oh. I was watching it last night and you were talking about the two main women in the film, the, the aunt and, and her and, and the niece. And just, I found it incredibly moving. I was like a little bit getting a little choked up at the end there. Um, but what it was for me, I feel like you in that one moment, in that one shot at the very end, you kind of capture everything we're talking about because they seem like these mirror images of each other. And so a part of you forever stays behind and it's this like childhood kind of forever trapped, almost like, uh, like a fossil, like a fossilized image of this girl standing there with her hand raised and then Anne that's leaning, you know, and they, they both hold up this like peace sign and like these two mirror images that are slowly just pulling away from each other, you know, and, and the gap just grows and grows and grows, but they're both there, like these two, two beings, and they're like one, but, you know, the, the gap increases somehow, and I just, uh, something conceptually about the very ending, I think at a conceptual level, a dramatic level, I think it works, of course, because it's, you know, this little kid is losing somebody really important, but it's other further level, uh, I just thought it really does capture everything we're talking about now, so I just wanted to say that I thought it was like a really moving and strong choice there right at the end, but I'll, I'll shut up now. And we established earlier that you, you, you realized that both of you realized that you have relatives in you boy and also have you, Darwin is featured in your film as well. That's right, my, my dad grew up in that, in that same town that Alexandra grew up in. Why, why are we talking in uh, English? 
Uh, it's, I'm just asking. <laughs> it's because we have audiences. <laughs> okay, okay. So that's a great question. We could switch to Croatian <laughs> or whatever you prefer to call the language. But I think that we have audiences that are actually international. That's a very diasporic festival that doesn't only have audiences who are from the region of the former Yugoslavia who speak the language, but actually uh, from all over the place. And since we're based in New York and we're such a such a mixture of so many things, we, we want to we want to give everyone the ability to understand because we can critique this as much as we want, but English is the language, right? No so want to add uh, let, let's let's just just tell this story. But I mean, uh, I think this war war going on, it's still war is going, if somebody don't know, it's war is still going on in Bosnia. I'm really not kidding. I mean, basically 30 years, I mean, uh, in, in, in minds of people and everything. And I, 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 in the beginning, I thought we will never go do films with war topic or something, but I still think it's, I'm planning to do TV series next year, six, six episodes, episodes in Bosnia. Uh, also, it's war topic. I, I think it's it's quite interesting to go back to that with this 30 years uh, time part. So I, I'm not against uh, to, to do this. I mean, Americans still doing film about Vietnam, so why not? Just telling. What, what else should we talk, tell? What other stories we could tell right now? I don't really see see this kind of perspective from from diaspora, from my uh, all my friends directors from this part uh, from former Yugoslavia. They they want to do something in uh, something with war. I don't know why. Yeah, well, it's a it's a very complicated question and an issue that we encounter is in our scholarship. I think I speak for both Amir and myself in our in our work, um, in our praxis, and also in our programming. We we often get questions from our audiences: why why is the slate always dominated by films that have war as its theme? And we're keep, continue to work through this, and there's no one definitive film. So this is why more and more films continue to be made, including this year or just this past year, Kova de Saida by Asmila Banić, obviously really important film, and including uh, films like, uh, you know, made in um, uh, Croatia, The Diary of Diana Budisavljevic, which is a um, really important film about World War II. Um, so we need to continue using cinema for working through some of these really important issues that haven't been uh, fully worked through. And I I always talk about this at every event. So if you've seen me before, you know that this is something that I bring up. But the, so the, so war is the backdrop, even, even if films are set in contemporary times as Alexandra's is, there's always this backdrop because war is still a living memory, this past war for most of the characters in that film. And, but Alexandra also tapped into this really important issue that she mentioned of young people leaving in a contemporary current situation, Bosnia and the region leaving and mass um, uh, in search of better opportunities. And the continuous war that Goran talks about by other means perhaps, and how that ties into the geopolitics of both local um, um, uh, context, but also uh, international with respect to the refugee crisis um, is very important to consider. But actually Sabina, um, you, with your film that we feature in our showcase, Variables, you do bring us straight back to the war context. So tell us about that process and, and, and how you came um, uh, to do this film. And also I do want to acknowledge that it's one of the last final roles of Mira Furlan. Uh, she appears in your film. Tell us about that. Uh, well, first I, you know, well, first, first, I want to just say, I yes, I watched all of your movies over the last few days, and I was really impressed. I, I really thought they were wonderful and um, moving in different ways. And I really fell in love with your grandparents, Bojana. Um, I thought they were just lovely. And um, and kind of to Garan's point about why do we keep making movies about Bosnia, about the war, um, there was a line in your film that really... Uh, I don't know, struck a chord with me. It's the taxi driver when they arrive and he says, oh, you know, the Dayton peace agreement just happened. And 
it's as if nothing happened. Like, you know, we're just mir, 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 nikko, 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 right? Um, and it's the feeling that's very prevalent in um, the sentiments of the, especially of my father and his generation, people who um, watched it happen. I mean, my father was very um, active in Banja Luka during the war, trying to save people. And I'm also from a part of Bosnia that I like to say it was never liberated, even though it's probably politically incorrect to say that. Uh, but it's a part of Bosnia in which uh, when I go back, people claim that nothing happened and are telling me that I left of my own volition. And I find that disturbing. I find that we, the reason we keep making movies about this is because we as a collective have not come to terms about what actually happened during the war. And we, the, it's a collective trauma that I feel like us as artists are constantly pointing fingers at, hoping that through our work, we're gonna address that issue that people are in denial about. They're like, you know, in Bosnia, nobody goes to therapy, right? So maybe our films can be a form of therapy for some of the people who watch it. And I, that's definitely something that motivates me a lot in telling these stories and kind of rehashing the past. Um, and Variables um, was a film that, um, it's a story is, is, is based on a true story that happened to a friend of a friend of mine. It's just this um, guy that I met once and he told me how he was in a math club and had to be smuggled out of the war zone to go to Canada and compete. And I thought it was a fascinating story um, that I just thought it was so bizarre that somebody during the war would um, be, you know, it's like you're pulling him out not to save him, but you're pulling him out to go and compete in some like kids competition. I mean, it's not even, you know, like, and then he, you know, in his case, he went back as did everybody else who went. And I just, I don't know, to me, it was just bizarre. Like, can you imagine pulling somebody out of, you know, like Germany in, in World War II to go and compete in like a singing competition in somewhere and then sending them back. I, I, I don't know, to, just weird in my head. And so I thought that was um, a story worth exploring. And once I started writing it, I realized that it was about much more than that. Uh, I wanted to put um, experiences that I had and then also other friends of mine. Um, the fact that he's half Muslim, half Serb is an homage to my friend Dana who, you know, has a, an, who's told me constantly that in post-war Bosnia, it's very hard for her to go because she doesn't quote unquote belong anywhere. So she's other. And, um, and I, not that I feel like I really belong anywhere there either because my identity is not so clear cut as those boxes that they now make us fit in. But I wanted to address that. I wanted to address this issue through a uh, character that, you know, Americans can't really identify with. To them, we all look the same, we all speak the same, they don't really understand. And so the best I can say is like, if he was biracial, you know, that's the closest and the sort of the, the underlying sort of issues that we have from this war is what they've been having for, you know, centuries now. Um, and yes, and so so in a sense, like, yeah, it was, a, it was an intimate story based on my friend's story that included uh, a lot of my own experiences, experiences of the people that, are, that I grew up with. And um, it's the one of the things that, you know, you guys were talking, it's for me to go to Bosnia and make this, shoot this film, which is what I wanted to do, it would have cost so much money that I didn't have. It's maybe easier to, you know, I don't know. I mean, I'm just gonna, you know, um, presume that it's easier to possibly go there from Italy or from Germany, uh, but from United States, just the tickets alone was would have been crazy. So my biggest challenge was to try and figure out how to make it look like Bosnia during the war in LA, which is all I could afford, um, as well as find actors to be in it, because I don't know how it is in other countries, but in America, it's proving that this younger generation that was born here, the first generation Bosnian Americans, are very hesitant to learn Bosnian. They're usually exposed to it when they're kids. And then when they start going to school, they rebel against it. And unless their parents are very stubborn, unless they have parents who just speak to them in Bosnian and refuse to speak in English, most of them, by the time they're teenagers, don't speak any 
or they understand it, but they just don't. And so to find somebody who speaks Bosnian, who can act at all was a big, big challenge. And, you know, I, you know, we did our best and I was very happy with the kids that I found. Um, and Mira was a very, very dear friend of mine. Um, our friendship was about 10 years old, if not longer. And um, I approached, I wrote the character with her in mind. Um, and so, you know, we talked about it and she said, yes. And, and, you know, of course it's, it's hard asking someone of an actress of that caliber to come and work with me in like, you know, I mean, we were shooting uh, scenes in a house with no air conditioning and no running toilet because we had to, we found one house in LA that could fit in for this like bombed out place. <laughs> and so I was like, you know, Mira, like, I'm gonna give you my car. You can go and sit in air conditioning in there. Um, but she was really wonderful and lovely and, and really generous, especially with the kids um, who, like I said, struggled with speaking the language um, as well as have never acted before. And then they were in a scene with her, a woman of that, you know, actress of that caliber. And, um, and she was very patient and very generous with them, which um, only goes to show what a great, great human she was. I want to, um, again, uh, this, this question of, of war uh, of, or always returning to the war, uh, when Goran was speaking, I also remember, I, I believe it was Milenko Yergovic who said that that war was dramatically unfinished. And this is perhaps the reason why we kind of keep coming back to it in one way or another, because uh, it continues by other means, as, as Diana has also mentioned. Um, and I do think also here about that, what Wayne mentioned also earlier about that question of audience, because uh, it seems, it strikes me as incredibly important uh, when making these kinds of work, who do they speak uh, to the most? And I know that Boyan, in your film, the, the return to Bosnia is, is kind of an attempt to reunite with family and preserve family history and pay homage in a certain way too. And Goran, your feature narrative, My Aunt in Sarajevo, is similar in, in some respects where the return is, is a self-discovery and also a return to an open wound. When both of your films are interesting in their quest for some kind of an answer or closure, which in reality may never happen. And I, and I really want to go back to that question of audience. Um, and who was your audience when you were writing and making the film? Or to whom do you want to speak with these films? Was this something that you actively really thought about when you were when you were making them, or just addressing the question of audience in general? I'm basically for me it was it was six years ago now I think, but at that time I I thought it in diaspora in Scandinavia and Europe they had. Um, they talk about this kind of topic, but they never seen the, in the fiction form. So I was lucky that my film it went to the cinemas all across uh, Sweden, and it was more seen film in the July and August 1916. I mean, it was like 10,000 something, which is very good for art house film. <laughs> so I basically, I think, and um, I think it was for for diaspora and of course for 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 some of Swedes, but uh, that was my thought. And and I want to do something in back in Sarajevo. So that was my thoughts about it. Because I think there is a strong element of identification. At least I know when when uh, one of my nieces watched your film, she said that she connected to the girl so much in, in so yeah. many ways through that discovery. Also, language being a barrier, as, as Sabina was saying yeah. earlier, that there are these kids that they don't know. I, I believe me, it's not possible. I, I have so many friends, even if both parents is from same country, and they talking. I mean, in the end, it's quite big job to 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 have kids speaking perfectly our language sometimes they talking so bad they it's like it's better to not speak <laughs> it's so many <laughs> bad words and uh, it's nothing so i mean it's quite difficult it's a big issue i mean it's big job to do to learn kids my my i unfortunately my my kids i have two daughters they they don't have a clue 
so because their mother is Swedish. So I'm, I've, <laughs> I didn't manage to do that. Sorry. <laughs> Brian, do you want to speak about the, the the question of audience specifically? I just want to say a couple of words about Gordon's film, mm -hmm. which I actually just watched this morning, which I really really liked a lot. And I want to ask you about your actor later on, who I don't think was somebody who had acted much before, from what I could see. Like I googled him. Uh, I find it quite impressive, but I think what his film manages to do is kind of bridge this gap between, I think, a kind of an audience like us, you know, an audience that would really understand that issue intimately and broader audiences, precisely because you have that sort of, I think, character of the daughter, who's a kind of, um, like, I think this can, this film can be watched a couple of different ways, you know, we watch it one way, somebody else is going to watch it another way, and I, and I think it was really done very sensitively. Um, and I, I, I was really quite impressed with it. And it also has this very good dramatic sort of hook that kind of take, takes us in, you know, I, I'm actually kind of curious where you got the idea for the story, where it was actually something that you heard about actually happening or? Yeah, it's my, uh, what is called, a counter. Uh, he, he, he was sending money to to, to go in right. Sarajevo and uh, he, he realized that, uh, it's mother died something like that so yeah it was, yeah, yeah yeah i heard from sorry it, it seems like it was something that would be like take out of a newspaper almost or something you know like the kind of story uh but for me i feel like the film that i made i, I do think it probably has some sort of universal qualities but I, I also think it's more of a hermetic experience just in terms of gauging reactions from audiences i know some sort of young kind of hip sort of like whatever think vancouver kind of filmmakers critics who kind of like i think watched the film kind of with curiosity and, but you can some, sometimes, the couple of people that I talk to, I think they kind of get it or don't get it, or they just see it as whatever. I don't know, maybe it's not formally interesting enough because the, the film could have been made a couple of different ways. Initially, I wanted to make a film that could have been more, maybe more kind of like, let's say formally challenging, but more accessible to a wider audience where I would have put myself more as this kind of center of the film as a character who's in a way kind of going through these archives and trying to find his own place. But one thing that I found early on when I tried that or thought about that approach is that it really would have taken away from the story I really wanted to tell, which is the story of my grandparents, really to give them a kind of a voice in this film. And so I decided not to pursue that more, let's say kind of formally, perhaps a little bit more inventive or challenging or kind of rigorous austere approach, which I initially kind of envisioned for the film and decided to really make something a little bit more almost old fashioned because I felt that the story had to tell itself. And at that point, I almost kind of, in a sense, gave up on the idea of the audience or even thinking about the audience. I had an audience of really only a couple of people in my head. One was just a close friend of mine who I reacts to films really well. And I kept imagining her in an audience, seeing this film and laughing. And, and so there was always this like one face when I would kind of make an editing choice or when I kind of had a certain particular doubt about something like, does this go too far? Is this gonna to be too much for somebody who doesn't know anything about Bosnia about the, the, the history there like so it, it, it was and it was also like for a long time I wasn't sure that I wanted to make films anymore after my first feature like I, I'd kind of turned to writing and just kind of writing prose and um, like I said for me filmmaking is a form of a kind of personal expression I'm not ever sure that I the type of person who can just be like a dedicated I don't know like a craftsman or somebody who could really just dedicate himself to the work of cinema as a kind of a career and so I, I really thought long and hard about, do I really want to do this or like pursue this medium? And, but one thing that kind of kept me is it, in it was always, well, I've been teaching it for 15 years, so I could never kind of get out of it <laughs> in that sense. But it, it was this particular film, which I kept going back to every couple of years and I would add a little bit of footage here and there. And I knew I had to finish it. Uh, of course, there have been other projects that I was kind of in and out of. Uh, but I, I did seriously think about maybe not making films at all, uh, but somehow this kept me in it, but it was a very weird hermetic personal thing. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I never thought about an audience too much, I must admit. I did think about it enough that I structured the film in a way that it could be understood, that it wouldn't be like too obscure or too, or whatever. But at the same time, um, I kind of tried to leave that concern by the wayside and really just try to kind of uh, do something for my grandparents because they really were involved in the film too. And particularly my grandfather really wanted his story to be out there to kind of, for it to be told. And so that's kind of what, what I guess drove me to finish it, to make it. I don't know if that answers the question, but. 
It does. No, the question of audience also, and you know, really thinking about it also can be kind of a, a burden if, if we think maybe about the audiences too much you know, during the production or writing of a film. It can completely steer or kind of mess with the creative ideas in such a way that you know some some kind of a, a very different kind of a hybrid kind of comes out of it. But I, I, I feel yeah I feel that also imagining a friend as as, as audience is, is is a really an interesting thing that you just brought up. And I'm wondering, uh, Ado, uh, with with you, uh, nomophobia. Speaking about something that is universally kind of uh, can be understand uh, understood uh, universally, nomophobia speaks about uh, um, social media obsessions, and it's almost a cautionary tale, also based on a true story. Um, and it has it can have different audiences. Oh, did we just lose Ado? It looks like his connection is gone. He seems to have disappeared just this moment. Yeah, I think oh here he's back. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna just repeat my question. So once he's back in. Are you back, Otto? You're back. I'm back, sorry. Okay. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, because I, I just added a question for you. So I, yeah, I was wondering about you. uh nomophobia as, as as a story that you know is universal in the sense speaks about social media obsessions. It's also based on a true story. Um, we can imagine different audiences for it, but here I want to also mention your other film, and, and now, now I'm thinking these are probably two different audiences, uh, your film uh, Let There Be Color, about the first Pride Parade in Sarajevo, which we screened at the last uh, film festival back in October, uh, and, and in terms of also logistics, you were going back to Bosnia to document this, to make this film, and if you could address uh, uh, also this question of audience or, or making film for, for specific groups of people, if, 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 if nothing else, but whether this is something that plays into your creative process a lot, uh, and maybe speak about the differences really between these two films that you made. One is a documentary, one is obviously a, a, a short fiction um, based on a true story. Yeah, thank you for your question. Questions? Yeah. Um, well, this uh, I always, of course, uh, do uh, have. I mean, I do films for myself, but of course, as much as I do them for myself, I think about audience. I mean, I do films for the people, for audience. This is the. I mean, the moment when I realize it. I mean, it's movies that I I'm happy and glad when the movies my shorts are selected to some festivals because people will gonna go there and watch them. I didn't make them to put them in the, I don't know, in my room and to play them for myself. I mean, of course we have different opinions about it, but uh, first of all, we are doing it uh, using our specific uh, aesthetic or film languages. So this is, uh, why I work a lot, uh, where I uh, invest a lot of time to think in which way I will gonna tell this story, in which particular way I will gonna tell this story. And uh, speaking about nomophobia, it is a universal story. It is a story that speaks about uh, illness of 21st century, no mobile phobia, uh, as uh, some uh, American. Uh, health institution called it the uh, illness of 21st century it's uh, three words and actually uh, before the pandemic period uh, it was like uh, we could say it was a problem but during the pandemic period and during today i think uh, using uh, cell phones using the technology i mean helped us helped us to stay in a touch uh, uh, with our members, the family or other people and to keep working. And uh, I mean, uh, technology, uh, for technology, you have to do, to find the right balance. This is the, the, the most important film was in, uh, inspired by true uh, fact that took place in uh, south of Italy where a teenager girl killed her mother because uh, um, she, her mother took her cell phone away and she took a, a pistol and killed her. And I think that was, uh, I mean, so many young teenagers today are using uh, uh, some applications in a wrong way and they, fin they end in a bad way. So that uh, short film was actually to send the message and to, to 
for for target was more for uh, parents and for uh, teenagers. I screened to many different elementary schools in Italy, and I spoke about it. And uh, of course, many of them they were. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, teenagers when they watch that movie, they uh, they like they never allow that this girl killed her mother, and then they are always the questions why she didn't kill, why why is that the situation? I mean, me as author, I decided not to kill, you know, because if you arrive in the moment just to point the pistol on your parents that's really huge that's big problem that's big issue it, you have big issue i mean if you do this uh, so i decided as author i decided not to shoot speaking about other other film uh, let there be color i'm really glad to do it and uh, what previously said um, um uh, sabina uh, i i of course, maybe it is easier to travel from Italy to make a movie in Bosnia. But of course, I think one of the most important thing is to have experienced people around you, to have a production company. I mean, when you have a right uh, and good uh, production company, you are working with less stress. You are working with people who could help you, who could help you, I mean, in logistic, in production, in casting, in everything. Of course, I'm still working on my shorts. I'm preparing my first uh, feature documentary film, but uh, I, I'm realizing it now. If you are having a good production company, everything is easier. I mean, I, I, I struggle a lot with some of my shorts because uh, even nomophobia, I done it uh, because of, uh, I, I made uh, some, um, um, how to call the um, collecting money from my friends and uh, trying to uh, involve them in the in the story but at the moment i'm uh, i'm working on my also uh, documentary film speaking about war uh, i mean every time when i meet with some balkan people in rome we end up uh, speaking about war in bosnia and uh, i realize that this is a really huge experience and uh, we we cannot uh, run away from the war all these years i was trying to run away i i never made film about war and uh, because of the many things that i struggle with my parents in srebrenica i mean it's something that i never wanted to go back and to speak about it but uh, my father, many people maybe we don't know, he was amateur filmmaker, he was amateur cameraman, and he made uh, amazing materials during those years in Srebrenica. And actually, it passed nine, 29 years. After 29 years, from like, I decided to, to make this film, documentary film about him. And actually, uh, last year, when I try to end with filming my father. I lost my father actually during the filming. So it, it you know, when, even when I decided, and actually my father didn't finish to tell me all the story about his filming in Srebrenica and all the way how he survived that march when Srebrenica was falling. So uh, I think uh, I realized in the end, I cannot escape. I cannot hide. I have to tell it. I have to tell this story, that important dark capture of history of myself, of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and to become a real film director. I think with that movie, I will become a real film director. Ado, uh, this is really moving what you just shared. And I, uh, from the films I've seen, I, if, even my humble opinion, you're already an incredible film director. But um, this actually what you just said segues into what I was going to ask and ask next of all of you, which is what you're working on next. Do you, do you mind sharing more, Ado, to go with you first since you um, already started uh, talking about it? You're going to use your father's archival footage in your film. Tell us a little more about the, what you're working on, what the process is. Uh, actually, in um, when my father had... Uh, 
how to talk in uh, back in 2016 i i started to film him a little bit with my camera it was like research so each time when i was going back i would uh, film him but of course each time he would tell me like uh, leave me alone i want to uh, live nicely i want to live in my peace don't uh, struggle around me you know he was he was saying all the time that he was struggling meanwhile i would uh, film him so it would be it will be actually a combination of the archive materials with the uh, materials that i filmed from 2017 till the last year so uh, i still don't know the structure because at the moment i'm uh, i'm working on it uh, i hope uh, to finish it on the end of the of this year and on the beginning on the next year I will not, I cannot speak about, uh, you know, like the names of the productions and other people, but uh, I, I'm really satisfied and, and happy how it's going. And uh, it, it, there is a lot of material that actually he made and uh, it, he was filming the life in Srebrenica. So this is always what my focus was to make film about the man, how he remained normal after all. Normal but also in somehow mm, normal but unhappy i think he was he stayed normal but unhappy because i think uh, he he suffered a lot after the war uh, because uh, he never lived like he like we lived before because you know in one day we lost everything and uh, all the goods that we had we lost and we and i think he always hoped that we will back again and live those those lives that we had during the yugoslav period and this never happened and i think he he suffered a lot about it thank you Adam. we really look forward to to, to your future work, this film um, included, and, and everyone else's future work. And this is why I'm asking what you're working on now. Gordon, you already mentioned some of the things. Do you want to add more on what you're working on currently? And then we're going to go around and hear from everyone else. You no, know, as I said, I mean, TV series, it's my third one now. Uh, after the Caliphate, what I made uh, two years ago, the uh i'm doing the 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 next uh, cult it's the most swedish uh swedish cult uh christian cult where they commit uh, uh serious crimes in the name of of god but it's a protestant church or some uh what is called i don't know but but it's very famous uh Book, uh, book uh, based and the six episodes we start in two weeks so i've been shooting for i'm going to shoot 60 days i'm finished 30 of august so it's quite a lot of work to do but uh, that's as i said now it's uh, very very easy to to find the financial uh, to to do the tv series and uh, it's going in sweden i i think just we have 20 in scandinavia 21 Netflix production going on this year and and we have Amazon coming in and it's crazy and uh, that's that's what I'm going to do for 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 60 days uh, shooting that's my next project okay. it's called Knutby if you want to search I have something on the page so it's very popular uh, book and it seems like the pandemic hasn't really slowed down the production much uh, I I got the Pfizer, so I'm happy. Uh, but uh, it's uh, it's qu quite bad in Sweden still. We we made quite a lot of mistakes here, so we we are the most uh, we have a lot of problems here with pandemic. But we still are going to do that, and uh, it's going to be difficult. And but I I hope for the best. Hoping for the best, and a, a lot of places made a lot of mistakes. We're all 
sitting in different countries in different contexts and so we have all gone through quite a bit and as i'm sure our audience is wherever you are but hopefully everyone is staying well and safe and getting the vaccines where when you can um uh, alexandra tell us about what you're working on what is the what is your current work um, I'm working on my first feature film that we are planning to shoot next year. And um, oh, it's going to be a movie in Germany and Bosnia. That's that's our plan so far. That's the script. And uh, yeah, we're working on it. That's so far <laughs> to say about the film. OK. So you're being secretive about it. We're not going to push you any further, but we look forward. <laughs> And the thing is, I do, I do want to point out that in our envisioning of the festival, the BHFF in New York City, we're always running into these kind of uh, reconsiderations of the definitions of what qualifies and what doesn't. And we're trying to be as op open as possible, whether it's a director's background or like, how do we qualify where a film comes from, right? And what the diasporic film is. Um, does it, uh, if it's a film about a specific context of a story that happens in Sweden and has nothing to do with the Balkans or in Italy or in LA or wherever in the world you are and if you hail from Bosnia or from Yugoslavia we still consider this so of course we're playing with these categories and, and kind of inventing them as we go along but it's also been incredible because it's exposed us to so much work that we otherwise wouldn't necessarily encounter including all of your work. Amir go ahead. Um, well, we're we're slowly running out of time, but I do want to give an opportunity to our panelists to um, to ask questions that they may have for for each other. Yes, and also we didn't hear from Sabina and Boyan on what they're working on exactly currently, and then questions, feedback, anything else, or if you want to keep that private, we can talk. So, well, Sabina and Boyan, tell us about their next uh, uh, production, if it's not a secret, obviously. Um, maybe you can also think of questions for each other, if there are any. Sabina, did you want to go first? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, um, I'm working on this film that's kind of, I, I described it for those of you who might remember this film as, as the big chill, uh, except, you know, set <laughs> back in kind of our region, um, which is about a group of people who, um, are like us, you know, I think mostly there's a couple, it's, it's a group of friends who all kind of uh, sur or were in Sarajevo during the war uh, into the 90s and then they kind of disperse. And one of one of the couples is still lives in Sarajevo, but a few other people kind of are elsewhere and they, they get together because of a funeral um, in Dalmatia and they ended up going to Bosnia as well during kind of part of that film. And it's a film, I mean, I, it was one of these things I, I'm interested in making certain kinds of films, just I think based on my personal experiences unrelated to anything else. So filmmakers that I really like are people like, probably my favorite filmmaker is Eric Romare. Um, I'm interested in these kind of simple films about men and women and, uh, relationships and which is probably like a far cry for everything else that I kind of think about or the kind of films that I've made. But that was initially the idea that I wanted to make a film like that um, but then, you know, when I thought about like where to set it or what else to kind of invest it with, all of these other things came back. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to explore what it would be like to make a film that really is concerned with what my life has been like in the past, I don't know, 15, 20 years and, uh, and deal with, 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 with relationships and aging and life and expectations and all that stuff. But set against the background of, of, of uh, this kind of, let's say, starting point that we've all had, which in some ways sets you up for life with a certain set of issues, a certain set of, let's say, kind of maybe traumatic um, kind of uh, foundational elements that sort of never leave, or leave, or I guess. Or, and so all of that sort of mixed up. But that's something that, I, that I've been working on, and I'm going to try to see, well... I've kind of gotten some funding. I'm going to look for some more money, kind of like Alexander, where I'm thinking maybe next year, but it's going to be a smaller film uh, just because of the kind of budget that it is. So I was actually looking with great curiosity, particularly at Alexander and, and Goran's films, because uh, 
I was looking at your cast and stuff and just thinking about all that and how do you go about casting? And one thing that I really have to tell you guys, because the two of you, I guess, were out of all of us here, the ones working with actors in that region, at least out of the films we, we saw on this panel. Um, there's one thing that's always kind of bugged me about Yugoslavian cinema, which is um, as much as I love Yugoslavian actors, if you kind of want to use that sort of umbrella term and all of that stuff, kind of the pre-war cinema, uh, I feel like our cinema was based around iconic figures and, and, and a certain style of acting that goes with that, you know, and, and a certain sort of, let's say, element of overacting and sort of bigger than life characters and so on, which always bugged me a little bit, uh, especially kind of as I got older as a filmmaker, I could never quite get over it. And I'm watching your films and, and I see a, a sort of a subtlety. And I think for people who kind of go to school there, and I think who come out of that system, there's probably an element of that that they still have. So kind of, I think working with actors and being able to get these really nuanced um, and subtle performances, it was really nice to see. Uh, I was really quite impressed, guys. Um, but yeah, obviously if we had more time, I'd, I'd like love to pick your brains about it. But uh, that's something that I've been, again, working on thinking about. So it's, yeah, it's, it's just kind of a, a feature film or a relationship film. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Sabina, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to you. Um, cool. Um, well, I mean, before I, again, I always have something to say, but um, Caliphate, I thought it was exceptional. So kudos to you. It was really, really wonderfully done. I, my parents turned me on to it and I think I binged the entire show in two days. So I thought it was phenomenally done. So, uh, but speaking of, so TV shows, so I have a couple projects. Um, one is a TV show that I just uh, partnered up with, speaking of Sweden, uh, with the uh, Yellow Bird, it's a Swedish production company. Um, and we're now going out to package it and sell it to a network. It's a US based I'm working, I'm working with them uh, currently also with uh, Stefan Baron. So uh, I'm very familiar with uh, them. So I have a new project for them. Thank That's great. So, you know, maybe we'll cross paths in Sweden. Who knows? Um, but yeah, I really love them. I th they're fantastic. And yeah, it's a US based show, but it has connections to Bosnia. It's about a Bosnian American. Um, that's about as much as I want to talk about it right now. Uh, but uh, my, my sort of passion project, my baby, what I'm really focused on while that is happening in the background and producers are packaging and, and pitching and um, is a feature film. It's called Poor Buddhas. Um, it is um, about a, it's set in a Bosnian immigrant community in Tampa Bay, Florida, which is where we landed. And uh, my first sort of brush with America was there. Um, and it's really about the generation that came here when there were, you know, six, seven, eight, and um, landed in places like St. Pete, Florida, where there was no Bosnian community before we showed up. There was no really infrastructure to help us deal with the problems that we were bringing from the trauma, the trauma that we were bringing from Bosnia. And um, the adults were usually too busy trying to get up back on their feet. We were all put on welfare. There was no sort of, it really wasn't a, a it was, it was a chaotic environment in which kids of that age were sort of left to their own devices. And a lot of the times we ended up in really bad parts of town because that's where they would put all the refugees. And so those kids had to turn to, they didn't have to, but they turned to crime sort of inevitably because, you know, their parents were working for four or $5 an hour. And meanwhile, they can run a package for some dude for 20 bucks a pop. Um, and so a lot of these kids did that and in red states like Florida, you know, by the time they're teenagers, they're in juvie. And by that, by the time they're young adults, their path is sealed and they don't really have a way to get out of it. And what I found with the community in, you know, my, in St. Pete in Tampa is that we don't really talk about it. It's sort of, if anyone's kid kind of slipped through the cracks and ended up in this environment, there is a big shame that we as a community have, the parents feel responsible, even though what I'm trying to say is that it really wasn't just that easy. And I was really interested in exploring this because um, 
my younger brother Tariq uh, passed away 10 years ago and he was very he was a member of this he wasn't really in crime or anything but a lot of his friends were and when they showed up at his funeral I was really introduced to this um, world that I in my very nerdy bookwormy way wasn't really a part of you know I was always my head was in a book not really in what was happening around me and I wanted to explore this and I wanted to shine a light on it uh, for us, speaking of audience, like it really is for us, it's for our parents, it's for us as a, as a Bosnian community, but also for the Americans to see who we are, how we are, that even though we look and sound for all intents and purposes as white Americans, um, we are much more complex than that. And what we bring to the table is much more traumatic and dramatic. And um, and I think that we as a community need to really step up and acknowledge that. And so I'm, you know, we're raising money. It's very hard in America. There are no um, grants of any kind. There is no ministry of culture. There is nobody other than a rich uncle that can give you some money. And unfortunately, none of my uncles are rich. Um, so it's, you know, that's the path we're hoping if we raise all the money to film it this winter, or maybe early next spring in Florida, I really want to film it there. I want to involve the community as much as possible. Um, and for all of us to kind of be hands on, like bring this Hollywood production to a mom and pop community that I'm a part of. Thank you, Sabina, I like the mom and pop community and thank you for sharing um, the story and very sorry to hear about the, the hardships and the losses and, and thank you all uh, for, for sharing your thoughts and, and there's so many other things that we would continue to unpack and we've barely scratched the surface but I'm afraid we're running out of time. Um, we have a very uh, robust audience but for some reason we can't extricate their comments and questions from the plat festival platform. So uh, we are going to try to do that and then pass it on to you uh, through a different format. Uh, I think we've covered plenty um, in the short amount of time we had. Uh, what we at least hope is that uh, we, we, I'm so happy we got to introduce you to each other if you didn't know each other already and to each other's work. Hopefully this is the beginning of beautiful friendships. Um, in many different directions. And I really, really want to thank all of you. And we really look forward to seeing what you do next. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And I just want to add that uh, the festival, the special edition of the festival is still running to our audiences. Uh, it's still running until May 31st. So you still have an opportunity to watch uh, films by the filmmakers present with us here today and others, uh, and please uh, see them if you haven't already. Um, thank you again to all of our panelists. This is amazing. And I, I hope, Diana, and I really hope that this is just the beginning of, of, uh, of these conversations, because it feels like as we're talking uh, that, you know, uh, different things come up and I keep kind of taking notes while we were speaking. I was like, okay, we should come back to this too, and to this and to this. So I hope this is just the first in a row of many conversations that tackle these subjects. Thank you again. Thank you all for being with us today. Thank you. Any parting thoughts, anything that we didn't bring up? Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. It yeah. was a pleasure to speak to you. Thank you for organizing this. Please, really uh, please nice send I'm, I'm just going to also send the right emails. Away. Everybody. Go ahead, Goran. Go ahead, Goran. Can you just send the emails from uh, panel uh, participants to each other? Thank you. Absolutely. Yes, we will. And um, I will also ask our panelists to stay on uh, for, for another minute to, to debrief because we're going to go offline in a, in a minute, but please stay. And Don't want, disappear. <laughs> if we want to thank our audiences as always. Thank you for supporting us, for being here with us. Uh, hope We hope that wherever you are in the world, that you're staying well and safe. Thank you for continuing to, to support cinema and uh, our regional cinema in particular whatever formation it may take. Uh, we really appreciate it. Okay, I just want to say a couple of words. Your festival is amazing, guys. I had such a lovely time. I just wanted to say that everybody should come out. Everybody in New York should come out and watch these films. And just, uh, it's such a social event, like a genuinely social event, you know? People hang out afterwards and before screenings. And it's uh, lovely, really lovely.
Thank you so much, Buen. We love it. We really miss, of course, we all miss the theat theaters, right? seeing movies in theaters, but the, not having that festival experience is Buen. And, and most of you actually were able to join and hopefully those who haven't, we will be able to host you in the future, but it's just a really lovely atmosphere. We really, really miss that. Thank you for saying it. Yeah, and we we'll look forward to a, to a reunion. Uh, it's going to be a big reunion. Thank you all. We're signing off. Bye, everyone. Thank you again. Take care.